Well, good morning, everybody. Here we are again for another uh, Cars and Coffee with me, Kenny Brown. And if you're a car guy or gal that wants to get real information based off of experience, not what you, somebody else heard, you're in the right place because we got a lot of cool things to talk about this morning. Uh, yeah, we got a lot. Of, this is this is a really this is a really good episode this morning. So lots of cool things to talk about. Uh, what we're going to talk about is. Uh, this is based off of some questions from last week. I'm going to talk about uh, the pros and cons of three-link suspension versus four-link versus torque arm. Uh, and that goes back to some questions from last week, which we'll get into a little bit. Uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, oh, another Transform Your Driving Experience workshop is coming up in the near future. And then there's been some, it was passed on to me, there's been some kind of like a whole bunch of uh, chatter, let's say, on the internet about jacking rails and f550 mustangs and uh, of course we'll answer questions if you've got any questions go ahead and send them in uh we'll get to them a little bit later or any uh, through the uh, through the uh, this morning's episode uh and then also uh the questions that we're going to do today all come from speed therapy society the kenny brown speed therapy society if you're not a member i'd Look it up. I mean, it's, it's a pretty cool thing. It's a private Facebook group, and there's some really great people on there that share a lot of stuff. I see, I see Carrie. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, it's, it's Kenny Brown Speed Therapy Society Facebook group. So it's a Facebook, private Facebook group. So you uh, just Google it, and you'll find it. Okay, Kenny Brown Speed Therapy Society private Facebook group. Okay, where should we start this morning? Uh, I think let's start with, uh, uh, we got some questions here. I think let's, let's, let's go to the jacking rails first. That was passed on to me. I, <coughs> I, don't, I didn't see this exactly, but uh, supposedly there's some chatter on the internet about jacking rails on S550 Mustangs. Uh, how that uh, Ford's, somebody, somebody wanted to know if our jacking rails would support the weight of the car. Well, absolutely they will. Because uh, I guess there's some some people are going back and forth that that you shouldn't use jacking rails and you should use jacking rails. I guess Ford says you should not use jacking rails. Uh, you should you should jack it up on the pinch weld. Uh, I, over the years, I've seen cars that have come in that people have jacked up the pinch welds and they had all been out of shape, and all of a sudden the pop or or pop uh, uh, spot welds start to come undone. I've been using jacking rails in my Mustang since 1986. And we sell a lot of them, and it's something that you really, really need to use. Now, our jacking rails for the uh, the S five fifties. Somebody wanted to know if they'll support the car. Trust me, they will. Our jacking rails, the five fifties, are completely different than anything else in the market because we took kind of a, a different approach. We actually engineered the jacking rails rather than just take some tubing and, and slap it on. Yeah. I can tell you, jacking rails are pretty darn stout. It's actually made out of 12 gauge, which is like 105 thousandths thick. And something that's pretty unique, I don't know if you can see that, is they're not square. They're, there we go. They're not square. And the reason they're not square is because the body, there's some really handy spots front and rear. We can bolt these things too. And with the 550s, the, the, the chassis are so rigid to start with, you know, it's not necessary to weld on there because you can just bolt these right on, which makes it easier. And they're pretty stout. The, the, what we did is the where these bolt to the chassis right here. It actually has a it's a five degree slant to it, so not parallel to the ground. Some of the other jacking rails we've seen they bolt flat to that, which means that they're kind of twisted. But with this, we actually have a five degree tilt built into it. So after it bolts to the chassis, it's now parallel to the ground, and so it's just a little bit below the pinch weld, so that. When you jack the car up, I mean, you're not going to squash the pinch weld. That's the whole idea of jacking rails is to preserve the pinch weld. Now, on the Fox Fox S197 and Gen 1 Mustangs, uh, they all weld to the pinch weld. And also, SN95 is a little different, but that also welds to the pinch weld. So, you get a really strong place. You can jack up the car. You can put jack stands under there. You know, to me, the whole concept of jacking up on the pinch weld or putting jack stands on the pinch weld uh, just... 
you know, I'm, uh, that, that's not, to me, that's not a good idea. So th that hopefully that'll dispel some myths that uh, whether or not to use jacking rails in a 550, absolutely. I mean, your life will be so much easier uh, with, with jacking rails than without. So I take care of that one. Uh, let's see, we've got uh, some, oh, here we go. I can't, Carrie's not here to give me signs. So I have to try to remember this on my own. Uh, if you're on YouTube, uh, you get three three things to click: the like, subscribe, and the bell. Uh, might as well do a hat trick at all of them. If you're on Facebook, uh, like us, uh, share. If you get some buddies uh, that you can share this with, go ahead and click the share thing because the suspension part is going to be really, really good. In fact, I've taken a few pages out of the Speed Therapy Academy uh, to kind of demonstrate the, the, the suspension. So that's something you're not going to want to miss or you're not going to want your buddies to miss either. So if, if you've got some friends, why don't you click on that and, and share it with them. So let's, uh, okay, let's take a look at... Uh, here are some questions. Mike Doan wanted about caging a car. Is it worth caging a car with a six point for HPDE track days, uh, both in versus weld in? Obviously, weld in is better, but you can't take the cage out if you decide uh, to trade in the car or sell it. Uh, I, I mean, anytime you can add any additional strength into a car, it's, it's a good thing. So, yeah, for HPDE, uh, if there's a safety measure, it also adds rigidity to the chassis. And you know, like, you just can't add too much rigidity to the chassis. Uh, you know, we go through in, in the Speed Therapy Academy talking about the street cars and the race chassis and the big difference in how rigid racing chassis are. So, I mean, adding a six point, you know, that'd be a great thing. And bolt on, uh, there's nothing wrong with bolt on as long as if bolt it on tight, you use either lock nuts so it doesn't come loose. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. That way you can, like you said, you can take it out and uh, when you sell the car and either give it to someone else or, or put it in your next car. And then Alessandra, I want to know how and where to position the fire suppression system for road racing. Uh, <coughs> well, there's lots of places and a lot of people have their own preferred places. Now I'm guessing you're talking about the full fire suppression system. That's got like a cable or a button that sets it off. Uh, <laughs> ironically, this is really weird. Uh, next week in the speed therapy uh, Academy, our, uh, the master class is going to be the uh, gentleman from from SPA, and he's going to be talking specifically talking about fire suppression systems. Now, for me, where to place it? Well, you're talking about probably some of it's five to ten pounds worth of weight, so you're going to want to put that somewhere in the car that you can use the weight to your advantage. Uh, now I typically will put them uh, right in the in the pat in the in the passenger rear the rear passenger seat floor. Uh, because that gets them, you know, behind the driver on the opposite side of the car, or you can put them somewhere in the left, uh, left rear corner of the car. Because that's for the Mustang. That's always the lightest corner is the back. That's why we always stick the battery in the right rear corner. So and any place that you need to put weight uh, is a good place to put it. Uh, like I say, I, I put them on the on the passenger side and the the rear seat passenger footwell. Uh, it's low and it's behind the driver and it's the opposite side of the driver. Uh, or you can put it in the back. So, but, but any, anywhere like that, I mean, it's you got you got tubes that run everywhere. So it's it's not real critical uh, as for, for, from a plumbing standpoint. So it's just need you think about where would you like to add this five or ten pounds of weight? Uh, okay, now Dale wanted to know about setting up sway bar end links. Okay, that, that's a good question. Uh, I've got I've got this is we got the five fifty and the one ninety seven end links and these are double adjustable which means that you can you can stick them in the car and you can screw them you can make them longer or shorter just by, by screwing this and there's a couple of advantages uh now sometimes when you when you lower a car the sway bar all of a sudden starts kind of pointing up in the air so you can actually use a double adjustable kind of shorten it up a little bit to kind of bring it down but the most important thing is to uh, keep from having uh, preload on your sway bar what, what do I mean by that is like if you hook one side of your sway bar up, then if you go to hook the other side up, you have to maybe bend it a little bit to get the, the uh, end link in. Uh, that's going to preload. And preload is what you don't want. Uh, you have a chance of with a preloaded sway bar of locking up a brake 
locking up one of your front uh, tires under hard braking. So with, when you've got an adjustable one, you can put one on one side and then the other side, you just adjust it until it just drops right in. So zero preload on it. So that's kind of like the advantage of, of the, uh, the adjustable sway bar. Anyway, like I say, that's for a 550 and this one's for S197. And something else that, that uh, uh, I'll give you a couple of little, little tips. I don't know if you can see this right there, but it's got the little marks on the bar. And then also there's some marks. Uh, they're really hard to see. There's marks on the, uh, there's a little boy hash marks on the, on the nut. What that means, that's left-handed thread. Anytime you've got like a radius rod or something like this that's got marks on one end, that's typically your left-handed thread. And left-handed thread nuts always have like a little hash mark on the corner. So that's kind of like a little tip so you know which, which, ends, which ends up. And something else that I do, uh, anything that we put together at any kind of like rod end or anything where we... Yeah, screw this and you can see that. Uh, you can see the, the different color. That's anti-seize. Uh, on the radius rods, all the radius rods we put together all have anti-seize. And sway bar end lengths all have anti-seize for a couple reasons. One, it helps with you got dissimilar metals, which have a, have a tendency to, to you know, kind of do some uh, chemical things over time and, and kind of get locked up. Uh, also, it makes it really easy to adjust. If you have to adjust, it makes it really easy to adjust. That's something that I don't know how many other people do, but like all our, all our uh, lower control arms, radius rods, or all, all have uh, uh, anti-seize on the threads, and they all can pre-adjust it. And we're going to talk about that a little later on because this is suspension day. Uh, let's see. Let's go end links. Okay, Dylan wants to know the proper ways to mount harnesses. Okay, there's lots of different ways to mount harnesses. Now, we've got uh, something else I pulled out of the Speed Therapy Academy. Uh, so let me pull it up here. It's something we got from Schrote, uh, you know, a while ago. Okay, this is from Schrote Racing. And I'm just going to kind of go through it. What we'll do is I'll have Brad put this in the Speed Therapy Society uh, resource section so that you can go in there and read it at your leisure because it's kind of lengthy. But I just kind of scroll through so you can kind of get an idea. Uh, it, this, th this goes, this is the, the Schroch recommendation. Ah, warning. Now you can tell that lawyers wrote this uh, because there's warnings everywhere. Okay, this talks about, there's the basic parts of the Schroch. More warnings, and they talk about the Ilex crest, where you want to have the uh, where you want to have the main your main uh, lap belt. And this is something else when and when we had uh, Ben uh, Ben O'Connor from uh, Impact come into the uh, Speed Therapy Academy and do a full evening on uh, the proper way to do harness belts and you know how they ended up where they are. He does a lot of good information on safety and harness belts and this this is nothing more than this kind of shows the difference between uh having like a hans device versus not having a hans device and you can tell this guy at the top's had a bad day okay more warnings what not what to do what not to do now here's where it gets into you know that you're always looking for a zero to 20 percent over the shoulder to the mounting uh you never really want to go straight down and this, again, this is, we'll, we'll have this so you can pre, you can download this and, and, and look at it yourself because there's a lot of information here. Uh, more warnings, more examples of uh, how the, you know, the different angles things have to be. Another warning, more warnings. Oh, guess what, more warnings. Right, 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 wrong, wrong. So, now this kind of shows you how you can wrap the uh, the harness, your harness, your shoulder harnesses over the. If you've got a harness bar or a roll bar, the best way to do it, and then this is the way to do it. If you've got like a, a loop, and here's some more examples of 
uh, you know, mounting the, the, the loops. And some more. And some more. Oh, another warning. Uh, let's talk about pull up and pull down. If you have a choice between a pull down and pull up lap belt, always go for the pull up. Uh, I can tell you from experience, much, much easier to adjust when you're sitting in the car. And then here's some more do's and don'ts, uh, wrongs and rights. And another warning. Let's talk about the ends. And another warning. And this goes into mounting to the car. Here's some additional information on mounting. Another warning. This would be like uh, in formula cars. You know, when, when we run the, like the sports cars, you know, uh, sports prototypes cars, uh, that's what we would use to mount them against the bulkhead. And another warning. And here's all kinds of wrongs and rights. The wrong way to do things and the right way to do things. Uh, and another warning. And another wrong, another right. Uh, more wrongs and rights. Uh, this is this is on a Hans device. You know, I, I strongly recommend anybody who gets past uh, novice and in the intermediate class think about getting a head and neck restraint. It's uh, it, it's re just really good insurance. And you know, what, what they're telling you here is if you've got extra, it needs to go up on the inside and not over the edge uh, because that in an impact that would have a hap that potential of sliding off, which you know renders your your head and neck device. Uh, uh, inoperable and another warning oh a couple more warnings can you tell that lawyers put this together another warning imagine that okay this 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 goes into the ways you can do with, with your harness bar what's right and what's wrong okay so anyway, we're going to, uh, I'm going to have uh, Rat, uh, Rat, Brad post that up in the resource section in Speed Therapy Society so that you can download it for yourself. And there's a lot of information there to kind of go through it at your, at your, at your leisure. Uh, so here's, here's a pop quiz. Uh, how many warning signs were there in that piece of literature? 22. I actually had to go through it. It just drove me nuts. There's so many warnings in there. Uh, I guess the lawyers are really trying to, you know, cover their butts. But nevertheless, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you can mount them depending on the car and the application. So that, that's why I pulled that up. I mean, you can just download that and read through it. And that'll give you, like, really good information. Okay. So let's see. Harnesses. Uh, oh, no, no note here. If you're just joining us, I'm Kenny Brown. This is Cars and Coffee. And we're, I'm sharing some really good information today. I think we just pretty much just jump into the main tech uh, section, which is uh, talking about uh, rear suspensions. Now, last week, Omar wanted to know what I liked better uh, for a for a racing, was it a three-link or a four-link rear suspension? And Maggie wanted to know uh, the difference between a three-link and a torque arm. Okay, well, I can tell you as far as which way to prefer, th prefer three link or four link, uh, whichever one has the best geometry. And because grip in a car, whether it's front grip or rear grip, it's all about suspension geometry, putting as much tire, putting as much weight on the tire as, as you can at all times to get the maximum grip. So, what I did is I actually pulled out, let's see if I can pull this up here. I pulled out uh, a few pages from the uh, Speed Therapy Academy. Uh, when we do in, in the academy, we talk about suspensions. It's it's two weeks. And we only talk about suspensions, but I, I spent a lot of time on suspension geometry, why it's important, uh, and how you calculate suspension geometry, and how you get the car to grip. And that's Suspension geometry is one of the reasons why my cars handle, my suspensions handle so much better than uh, than the other suspensions that are out there because I've been 
paying a lot of attention to rear, to rear front suspension geometry since 86 slash 87 and with the Selene endurance cars that I uh, built and engineered. Uh, and actually, we that's, that's turned into my advanced geometry suspension systems, uh, better known as AGS. And for the S197s, we are AGS 4.0, which is the fourth generation. Gen 1 of AGS goes all the way back to 1987. I think it's 87 through about 88 or 89. And then with each each new uh, up, update, I take the best of the previous uh, generation and t- carry that over and make other improvements. So by the time we got to Gen 4 and S197 Mustangs, I, mean, I got really, really good suspension geometry. And we're going to talk about that. Okay, as far as three links and four links, there's different kinds of three links and four links. Uh, this shows the parallel three link, parallel four link, and parallel three link, and also triangulated. Uh, I refer kind of refer this to, as to splayed. And this is this is an example of uh, this is similar to what's on an S197. It's a three link with a panner bar, which is you know pretty common uh, setup. Uh, but the uh, the thing about it, we'll get the panner bars and watch links in a minute. But anytime you've got parallel uh, trailing arms for rear suspension, you have to have something for lateral location. Otherwise, it's going to fly all the way around. Now, when you've got triangulated, this is sort of self-centering. Okay, so using a panned rod is lateral location. Now, here's another picture of you know a triangulated or splayed. Uh, upper control arms, which it's se- self-centering, they keep the axle centered. And here's a more, this is like a double splayed uh, setup. And here is the, you know, the uh, S197 Fox Mustangs. They've got a double splay. And you can see the double splay. And, I mean, it's good for locating the axle. But I can tell you that the rear suspension geometry uh, on these is not particularly good uh, for a number of reasons. Let's see, get back here. Okay, now wherever the panner bar crosses the center line of the car, right there, that's the roll center. That's the the geometrical point at the back. The back of the car wants to roll around. Now Mustangs have the roll have the panner bar up pretty much in the middle of the differential. And as you go around a corner, you can just feel uh, that inside tire. You feel the car roll up and you feel that inside tire getting light. Uh, that's because the roll center is high. Now, the, the, there's two ways to locate uh, lateral location for rear axle. One's a panner bar and the other's a watts link. Now, a watts link is technically the best way to locate for lateral location of the rear axle. However, the problem arises is wherever the, the center pin is on the bell crank, that is your roll center. And because of the way the bell crank goes, it's really difficult to get to move your roll center down. Now, uh, I moved the, the, in, in our uh, AGS 4.0 rear grip kit, we moved the panner bar all the way down to the bottom of the differential. So we moved the roll center from the middle of the differential down to the bottom. It's about you know, four, four inches or so. Uh, with the watch link, you can't quite do that. Now, back in, in the Trans Am days, what we used to do is we used to take a watch link and that horizontally to the bottom of the differential so that we'd get the benefit of a watch, but we'd also, also put the roll center on the bottom of the diff. Uh, now, on those cars, it was easy because they have like an underslung chassis, so it's easy to just go right over and, and hook the, uh, you know, the radius rods off the bell crank, the chassis, where in a Mustang, it gets a little more complicated and plus, there's only so low you can get that the the watts link. So that's why I set the panner bar. It's it's simple. It's uh, it's lightweight, and we can get the roll center all the way down down to the bottom differential, which which really helps the back of the car handle. Now when we get to the, get to the Mustang, the problem is if you do if you draw at the suspension geometry, what happens is your roll center ends up being I can't remember now. It's like 17, 18 inches off the ground which is really high. And that's why the back of, of uh, Fox and S- SN95 Mustangs have so much roll to them and they have such little rear grip. So back again, we were doing, uh, you know, we were doing the uh, AGS 3.0 for the uh, SN95 Mustangs. We used, introduced a panner bar uh, 
and the panel bar was not there for axle location because the splayed control arms locate the axle. It was there to defeat the factory roll center and introduce a new roll center at the bottom of the differential. And that worked really, really well. Uh, we haven't brought that particular product back because it was one of those real, say, a pain in the butt type of, of products. Uh, the first issue we ran into is the real estate in the back of an SN95 Fox is really tight. So packaging that in there around the exhaust systems was a problem, you know, because, you know, everybody had a different exhaust system and everybody expected, you know, our, our parts to fit their exhaust system. I think we had four different, uh, we used to call them track kit plus, four different pattern setups based on different exhaust systems. And even though we'd engineer it, so there's plenty of clearance around the exhaust, we still have people complain. Uh, and what they didn't realize is they either had the, the exhaust mounted wrong or they didn't allow enough room because the exhaust will expand. So that was a big complaint to people. They didn't understand that, you know, okay, we, we build a product to fit most of them. You have to figure out how to make it work. And the other thing is people would not read the instructions and they would not, the, when you're running a panner bar to defeat the roll center uh, and, and introduce a new roll center, it has to be zero preload on it which means that ride height, you need to be able to slide one of the bolts in and out with any preload. Uh, people wouldn't read that. Uh, they'd, they'd, uh, they'd put the panner bar on, was up in the air, jack it down, they'd preload the whole thing. So you'd have the, the panner bar fighting against the, the upper control arms, the center of the axle. And, and so it's just, it's just one of those products we didn't bring back. At some point, I'm going to do a new rear suspension for Fox and, uh, and, and SN95 live axles. But for right now, the big thing we're using on Fox and SN95 is IRS, and we uh, we we have we're the only people that really understand the IRS and support it. So anyway, that's that's you know that's the kind of like the geometry, you know, three link or four link. Now we get the torque arm. Torque arm is absolutely my least favorite. You now without getting too deep into geometry, the the instant center is controlled, and you don't have any. any you know, with, with the three link, like the, the S197 three link was just a joy to work with because I, I, it wasn't, wasn't really hard to create the geometry I wanted uh, by moving the pickup points around. But when you've got a torque arm, you're kind of stuck. Your instant center, which has to do with anti-squat, uh, is kind of fixed and you can't do much with it. Uh, and the only reason these work so good, I mean, they work in forward, they're really good for forward bite. But they have some some issues uh, in in braking and some other things that uh, I'll kind of get to. Yeah. Stop sharing for just a second to show you something. Okay. Okay. This is this is this is sort of like my Bible, uh, the race car vehicle dynamics. I mean, this is you you talk about this is super heady stuff. Uh, but in here, there's a huge section on suspension geometry that I've read through maybe, you know, 20, 30 times. Uh, that has been kind of like the foundation for what, what I've designed in suspensions. But what they talk about in here uh, on page 657 and 658, and I actually had to take, this, uh, we, we have this, the Academy guys uh, have access to this, but it's on, the, the description's on three different pages. So I had to like cut and paste. But here's what, uh, here's what they say about a torque arm. It says, this suspension has a fixed side view swing arm that is borderline acceptable. Power hop and or brake hop can occur with this type of suspension. The amount of anti-squat obtained is limited because the height of the side view instant center can never realistically be raised even as high as the, the current center line. 30% is about maximum obtainable. Uh, to assure roll understeer, the lower control arm must be angled downward at the front. That's pretty standard in the stuff that I do. And this also means that the side view swing arm instant center height will be low. Okay, well, let me get back to sharing that picture again. So what they're talking about, this is the instant center. And, and I'm not, not going to, there's, there's like too much information to even try to give it to you uh, in, in a short, in, in, in short spurts. But like I say, in the academy, we spent 
two old weeks going through suspension, suspension geometry. But the instant center has to do with your anti-squat and it's very limited. And I, I can attest to what uh, was written in the, in, the, in the textbook is I was driving. We had we built some uh, 95 Cobras for a couple of customers Put on the Cobra twins. One was red, one was white. And I mean, they were really cool cars. I mean, they were you know, full suspension. Uh, we, they still had the Windsor motors. Uh, we bored and stroked them at the 352, I think. And they were just an awesome car to drive on track. And the guys that we sold them to just love track days. What they do, they have a big semi and they would run a trace place like Putnam that I met them at one time. And they would bring like three or four cars a piece. And I asked them why they bought so many cars. It was really simple. They thought, well, one breaks, we just got more, another one we can drive. So they, I drove one of their, I can't remember if it was a Camaro or a Firebird. And the, uh, the torque arm was originally introduced in uh, 1924 on Type 35 Bugatti. Uh, GM used it pretty extensively in the Camaros simply because of packaging. Uh, it was really easy to package. Uh, not, not really the best in handling, but easy to package. And then some, I guess not for Mustangs, uh, somewhere on the West Coast uh, for like NASA racing. Somebody, you know, put a torque arm on a car and it worked better than the standard suspension, which really doesn't work very good. So everybody thinks the torque arm is the only way to go. Well, it's, it's you know, it's better, but it's really not the optimum you can, you can do. Uh, you know, it, it's, you know, suspensions have come a long way since 1924. And, you know, I was driving a Camaro, I can't remember Camaro Firebird with the torque arm in there and Putnam, I can't remember the name of the corner, but there's one that you I break really, really hard, go in deep and kind of come around. It's not quite a hairpin, but it's pretty close to it. Uh, and, you know, I can get around that pretty good by going really late, breaking hard and then turning in late. And when I tried to do that with a Camaro, the whole back of the car started bouncing all over the place. And then when I finally got through the corner, I just heard this clunk, clunk, clunk under the car. So I drove back to the pits and I told them there's a, there a clunk in the car. And they said, ah, the torque arm came loose. So it's something that happens to them quite a bit. So that kind of tests the fact that the torque arm, you know, did hop a lot under hard braking, which means that with the geometry I have in S197 rear suspension, you can outbreak a, a torque arm suspension like, like crazy. Uh, and that's the best time to pass somebody's under braking. So the other thing I don't like about torque arms is they're heavy. They're big and heavy. They add a lot of mass, unsprung, unsprung weight uh, to the rear axle. And it's like, you know, unsprung weight is your enemy. The heavier something is, the more energy it takes to move it. So if you've got, already got an axle that's pretty heavy, add more weight to it, it's going to take even more energy to move it around. And here's another, another version that actually has a watch link included. And uh, I mean, that's... It's a lot of weight and a lot of complexity uh, that I just, you know, I'm not, I don't like. Uh, I, I, in all my years, I've come up with a better solution, and this is it. This is my S197 rear grip kit. Uh, it's simple. It's elegant. It's lightweight. Uh, it actually saves a lot of weight in the back, and it works like crazy. Um, and it's not, they, they, it's not parts. It's a system. Every piece in the rear grip kit is engineered to work with every other piece to improve rear suspension geometry. Now, starting from the back is the panther bar. Remember I said we have a panther bar relocation kit? This is how far down we move the panther bar. That's like four inches down to the bottom of the differential. So the back of the car doesn't want to roll up as much. Uh, the, between bringing the rear roll center down in the rear grip kit and the front roll center up in the front grip kit, it takes the angle uh, that, that points down into the ground and makes the front of the car push like crazy and flattens that out so you can get to the gas sooner. And then the next part that we do is we've got axle brackets uh, to relocate the pickup point on the axle. And this is all about anti-squat. It, it's interesting is like there's, every, everybody has axle brackets now and a lot of them have like multiple holes. You know, there's only one hole in my axle brackets. And that's because, you know, I've, I've done the math, done the research, done the testing and I've, I have already engineered uh, where, where I think the best instant center is for the best anti-squat for the back. The anti-squat, which is where it really gets the power down off the corner, uh, it also is anti-lift, which under hard braking, the back of the car is the one to jump up so much. 
So between the where I move the, the pickup point on the axle brackets and also the U-link upper control arm module is, is longer than factory and the pickup point is moved. Again, so I, I can I can Im impact by the you know drawing a line from the, uh, the pickup point through the front out out to where it intersects with this, and that gives us the, the instant center and the anti squat that I'm looking for. Uh, again, we talk about that extensively in the uh, in the academy. And the other little trick that I do is the the, the uh, control arms on 197 are splayed outward at the front. So what we do is I've got the bushing, so we 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 take and we, we move the, uh, the front part in and the back part out. So now we've got lower control arms are parallel to the center line of the car, which all race cars have parallel control arms. And by making them parallel, if you were if you look at a stock one, look like down from the top in plan view, and you were to take and, and draw a line back where the, the two uh, lower control arms uh, intersect, it'd be you know well behind the car. And if you take that point, and you uh, draw a line from that point up through the roll center. In fact, your roll center is up high. Then you've got your, your roll axis is pointing up in the back. And uh, that's not what we're looking for. So by making these parallel, uh, there, is no, there is no conversion uh, of, of, uh, of, of the lines, which means the, con the uh, conversion point is infinity. So now the roll axis is the, the, the uh, roll center, which is the bottom of the diff is parallel to the lower control arms, which just keeps the back of the car so nailed down. I think this is this is the absolute, in my view, the absolute second best rear suspension that's available for Mustangs today. And I said second best. Why is it second best? Because this is AGS 4.0, Advanced Geometry Suspension System 4.0. This is the new, uh, not very well known because it's kind of like been a secret, AGS 4.5. Uh, this system is patent pending right now. And it, uh, it does absolutely, totally amazing things. Now they're, it's pretty complex. So we're just building these in small lots. Uh, we'll do another, uh, we'll be doing another, I think, webinar on this, on the, uh, the K-Link uh, in the near future. But the big feature, is the fact that it decouples axle roll and body roll. Uh, so it doesn't matter how much the body rolls going through a corner, uh, the axle is decoupled and the axle stays flat on the ground with the same amount of weight on both rear tires all the time. So the, the grip is just amazing. In fact, there's so much rear grip that we have to go way up in rear spring rate. Uh, just to get the car ba balanced again, uh, so the front uh, front front will turn. We actually run the spring rates on on these cars just like we do on an IRS car, which is kind of strange. And the other thing that it does, aside from decoupling axle roll and body roll, is it lowers the roll center a lot, way lower than anybody ever thought possible in a live axle car. And only the people that have them know just how low that roll center is. But we'll do an, we'll do another uh, another uh, webinar. On the, on the K-Link rear suspension system, and it is a system. Uh, like everything I do, it's my my suspensions are only three basic components: the rear grip, front grip, and springs and shots. Because again, systems, it everything has to work together to work. So this is this is the newest. Uh, if you're interested, you can set up a 15-minute consult. We can talk about it. But this is this is more for advanced type people. Uh, but, you know, kind of the question becomes, you know, how good is it? Well, let's see. Let's see. I think Steve out in the West Coast. Uh, I think he picked up three or four seconds with rear grip kit one off his best times and on, on this one track. And then with the K Link, he picked up four seconds. Uh, we got another customer, uh, David, at uh, what, uh, not Laguna, uh, Sears Point. I don't know what it's called now. It used to be Sears Point. When I raced there, that, that's what I called it. So, uh, anyway, at, at uh, uh, Sears Point in, uh, in Northern California. Uh, David has a Boss 302S. So the difference between the, you know, the the suspension that comes on a Boss 302S and my full, he did the full AGS 4.5 uh, front grip kit, rear grip kit, and uh, the JRZ springs, springs and shocks. Uh, the difference was he was eight seconds a lot faster. So Nobody else has anything like that. That's why I spent a lot of years working on that. That's why we're, we're, we've applied for a patent on it. 
So that kind of gets through. We got to just about everything. Uh, oh, uh, let's see. The Transform Your Driving Experience Workshop is coming up August 23rd to 26th. So mark that on your calendars. That'll be in the evening, uh, seven around seven to eight, and it'll be on Zoom, I think. Uh, so it, it'll be. Uh, yeah, I think you need to sign up for it. Uh, I don't know if Carrie's there. If she can, can add add some to that. Are you still there, Carrie? I I sure am. So uh, we have. I'm going to take my big face off of there. Um, there we go. So. Yeah. Uh, we have the Transform Your Driving Experience Workshop. If any of you have ever gone through it, it's uh, really quite the awesome experience. Uh, Kenny goes through four days of how to transform your driving experience, obviously. And uh, it talks about the top five things uh, you need to do uh, when planning a build. And he also talks about, coincidentally, there's another five. My, my five secrets to making my yeah. cars work. Yeah. So it's pretty interesting what he shares. Everybody that has gone through it has loved it. So that's why we're doing it again. It's backed by Popular Man. It is August, uh, in two weeks from now, August 23rd. It starts on a Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Um, it runs for four days. Uh, it's about an hour, hour and a half, depending on how many questions he has at the end of the session. So it's not a lot of time, but it's definitely worth the taking. So if you're interested in that, there will be a link in the comment area that Brad's going to add. And uh, you, you need to register for the event and sign up for the speed to be in the Speed Therapy uh, Society Facebook group um, because that's where it's being held. If you're a non-Facebook user, because a lot of people may be watching this through YouTube, uh, you can just uh, register and there'll be an email. You can uh, email me and I'll make sure that you at you're in attendance. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a really cool event, Ken. Okay. So that's the uh, that's the uh, workshop, and uh, huh. well, I'm I'm reading my notes, and my uh, my my notes aren't quite the same as I remember them. Uh, also, uh, we're going to do. I, I keep mentioning Speed Therapy Academy, which uh, if you really want to learn this stuff, if, if you want to be able to go to track and know how to just do everything. You know, how to set your car up, how to adjust your car, how to drive your car. Uh, the Academy is a 14, 15 week course, something like that. And I go through the whole car, uh, you know, everything, how everything works. Uh, spend a lot of time on suspension and suspension geometry because that's what, what, what really makes my cars go. Uh, we spend like a couple, a couple weeks on aerodynamics. Uh, how arrow works around the car. And, you know, once you kind of get the general idea and all of a sudden it makes sense and you can do your own thing of arrow work. Uh, and, uh, and then like the, uh, the, we're just wrapping up this academy and, and we're going through uh, a whole bunch of troubleshooting and adjustments on tracks and how to, how to make things work. And then we, I think we've got the uh, suppression, this fire suppression uh, master, master class coming up. Uh, we actually have a whole bunch of master classes in there. Uh, we did safety, we did cooling, we did plumbing. Uh, what else are we driving? Uh, there's some other ones. There's so many I can't remember. How about that? Yeah, so, so anyway, that, that's coming up. Uh, look at your screen. Look at your screen. Ah. <laughs> that's coming up uh, September 14th. So uh, I, I guess also there's some early bird specials on that. So anybody who's ever taken the Academy can attest to the fact that it's, it's well, well worth the, uh, the time and investment. Uh, it, uh, it really, uh, really it will educate you in a way that you won't find out the stuff anywhere else. In fact, what I talk about on Saturday mornings, even you won't find any place else. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation. I tell people the worst place to get information is the internet and the paddock, uh, or the guy down the street who thinks he knows everything. So, but I, I try to, you know, I don't know everything, but I've been doing this for a very long time. Uh, you know, like 50 years building really great cars and in, I spent a lot of my time in professional motorsports. So, uh, you know, what I share is from my experience, not from something I heard or something I read in the book, but except stuff that I read in my, in my, uh, in my uh, uh, textbook, let's call it. Uh, I read a lot of stuff in there and that, that's like the real stuff. That's legit. So, uh, I think that I run out of everything to say. 
Yes, you did, but I, I haven't ran out of things to say. So just in summary, we have two events coming up. One is a Transform Your Driving Experience. It's a four-day workshop. I see an uh, error there in the, the banner. Uh, four-day workshop, and that starts August 23rd. It's a free workshop. It's online. Uh, you just need to make sure you register for it. Um, it should be a pretty full session. Uh, and then we have the Speed Therapy Academy uh, set fall session coming up, and that is September 14th. And if you've considered in the past, I recommend signing up early. I think this is going to be a really full session for us. There's a lot of people that couldn't do it this summer that are wanting to do it in the fall. So uh, make sure you sign up early for that. Next week, I'll be telling you about some of the specials, uh, early bird specials on the Speed Therapy Academy. Okay, cool. Well, I guess we can move on to, do we have any questions today? Uh, we sure do. Let me get to them. And just scrolling through here. The first question is um, from Facebook user. I'm not sure who that is. Um, he didn't sign in through StreamYard. So it says, thank you. What about the nozzles for the fire su suppression? I've heard uh, two. I'll put it up to you. Karina. I've heard two in the engine bay, one to the driver, one in the rear. I have a fuel surge tank with a firewall. Okay, uh, it, if you've got, depends on how big your system is. Uh, I mean, if you've got just a small system, you gotta be, you gotta be pretty prudent on where you put them. You know, I would always go for a bigger system uh, because I think, you know, what, you know, two in the engine bay, one in the driver, one in the rear, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I mean, you, you can even think about where's the where where's the most uh, probable place a fire is going to happen. It's either going to be in the engine or under the back of the car where the fuel cell is or fuel tank. And the other thing is you want to be sure that you keep fire away from the driver. So uh, if you've got a big enough system, yeah, that that's I, I don't see any problem with that. I mean, you can just think to yourself, you know, where, where do I want to keep the fire down? Uh, you know, maybe you want to do two for the driver, one for the front, one for the back. It just depends how big of a system you've got and how many nozzles it'll support. Uh, you know, the bigger this is one case that the bigger is, is bigger is better, and it's worth the uh, it's worth the, uh, the sacrifice and weight to get a better uh, uh, system in there. I, I tell you what, uh, next this week we're doing a master class with SPA, and I'll come back next week and uh, report if they if he has anything to say that's different. So how about that? Okay. So here's the next question. Um, is it true that the uh, S550 added 35 pounds of extra steel to reinforce the roof and the door? If yes, would a roll cage be enough for HPDE? Uh, I, don't, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I know that the 550 is an extremely rigid platform. Uh, they had to because of the, you know, the, the uh, the, the double lower um, McPherson in the front and also the IRS in the back, it really had to really had to step step up their game and make the chassis super stiff. It, as far as uh, the roof and the door, uh, there's always there's always extra weight in the door because there's a there's a there's a heavy heavy bar right in the door uh, for side intrusion, and the roof has to pass safety standards for rollover uh, protection, but. Uh, would, it, would a roll cage be enough for HPD? Sure. Uh, I mean, HPD, I mean, there's rarely any huge crashes. As soon as I say that, there's going to be a big one. But uh, no, I, I think a roll bar, in fact, we, for our, our track day cars, uh, you know, all the way up through advanced for 550s, we got a four point roll bar that we bolt into them that, uh, that works really good. And I mean, the rest of the chassis is so rigid that, yeah, I mean, if you got a 197 or 550, uh, we've got a four-point roll bar that bolts in. In fact, we're installing another one this week. So the answer is yes. Okay. Okay. Before we get on to the next question, guess who's in the house? Ben O'Connor. You were just talking about him. Good yeah. thing you didn't say anything bad about him, huh? <laughs> yeah, good thing. Uh, ben, ben, uh, ben is from uh, Impact Safety, and uh, he, he does a master class on safety on on seatbelts, you know, how they work, you know, the best place to put it, you know, why the why seatbelts or harnesses are designed the way they are. So yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like every, every time he's on, every, and when we have master classes for the academy, every time one of these these guys come on, and what they all are, they're all, you know, guys I know in the industry, they're experts in the field, 
to come on and, and share some of their knowledge and in a format that you know our guys in the academy can ask questions but and anytime we have one of the master class guys on i always learn something so if you ever stop learning uh you might as well take a dirt nap because there, there's no sense of going on okay so so I have an I have another question uh, just uh, just to get you guys' comments on this. Uh, the master class is like every other Thursday. Uh, we pull in another expert as far as Speed Therapy Academy. Um, I was thinking of maybe offering that as a separate class. Um, you know, it wouldn't be as expensive as Speed Therapy Academy, but it would be really kind of worth going through that. So let me know if anybody would just want to take the master class series by themselves. It'd probably be eight sessions over four months. Okay. So make a and, comment on that. And I see a question on my screen. Yes. Is there a preference between staggered and square setup running your suspension systems on S197? No, nope. not at all. Uh, my suspension is about geometry. <clears throat> and it's about, you know, making the car, you know, have as much grip as possible. As far as square and staggered setups, <clears throat> what we do, if somebody wants to run a square setup and they're not running like, like, like stupid, like big power, uh, you know, my favorite is uh, 19 by 10, all four corners, and uh, 285 35s. That's a really good square setup. Uh, our staggered setup for like Coyote cars or you know uh, GT 350s or GT 500s is uh, 19 again 19 by 10 front with either a 285 or a 295 depending on the the specific car, and then a 305 on the back. Uh, but the suspension will work great no matter what the square or staggered doesn't matter. I mean, it's what the suspension is doing is it's giving you the biggest opportunity to put the, the most grip into the car. And if you add more tires, then you can get more grip. Okay. Here, just a comment. I thought this was pretty cool. 4.5 system is badass. Uh, yeah, it really is. <laughs> and I mean, then, it's uh, it's uh, when, when I do when I do the next uh, webinar on it, you're going to find it's been 20 years in the making. And that's why we went ahead and applied for a patent because it, it does things that up until now have not been thought to be possible with a live axle car and uh, it works really really well so so here's another one from uh, tim thomasak on the k-link too it looks great almost too nice to put under the car <laughs> so true too <laughs> yeah i mean uh, we get a lot of comments when the the, uh, the guys that have got them first open the box they're just blown away i mean it's when you see it in person it's pretty staggering i mean it's uh it, it's 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 really well made. The, the, the geometry I put into the just the mechanism itself is uh, it took a, a long time, and all the pieces or the machine pieces are beautiful. I mean, it's it, it is like like a, a piece of art. Here's another K Link um, right here from Anibus uh, Ferro. An Anibus actually has our uh, front grip kit and the rear grip kit, and it looks like he may have the JRZs as well. Uh, when the 4.5 rear becomes available, can you still use a JRZ coilover, or do you need to uh, run the strange coil? Oh, uh, no. If you got JRZ coilovers, all we need to do is just uh, change rear spring rate and add a couple of foots of rebound. Uh, I would much prefer the JRZs over the uh, the strange. So. Okay. And, and actually, it, it is available now. We just put them out in the small lots. So. Yeah. So, uh, Anibus, just give Rich a call, and he'll be able to help you through that. Um, the or, other, or, set, or set up a 15 minute consult. Yeah, that's that's a good point to set up. A, anybody can set up a 15 minute consult with Kenny. Let me find the next question. Here we go. Um, also, I just want to let you know since we're on the K Link that uh, the you don't know this yet, Ken, but the K Link <laughs> live in R is scheduled for the third Wednesday of September. I don't have the date in front of me, but uh, we'll be letting you know a little bit about that. We want to get through this uh, transform your driving experience workshop first. Here we go, Dylan. Hey, wait a second. Have you guys ever noticed that I learn about things that are coming up the same time you do? That that's way that way you can't say no. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> okay. Dylan, what's your thoughts on upgrading to a so, uh, solid steering shaft like the ones Maximum Motorsports offers? Okay, I'm not sure exactly what it is that you're talking about. But uh, so let's just say you're looking at a solid, solid steering shaft from let's say the, the steering rack up to the, the cabin. Uh, if it's a street car, I would kind of stay away from that. Uh, and the reason being is that the, uh, your steering shaft on a street car is built, there has, has some safety devices that's built into collapse. 
so that under a frontal impact, the steering shaft collapses and it doesn't like push straight up and push the steering wheel into your chest. Uh, even in some, some, uh, some race cars will actually have like a, something in the middle that will actually collapse under front impact. So if it's a real, a real race car, uh, that's kind of like a different story. Uh, then you, and typically you'd want to run uh, a solid shaft. But in a street car, I think I'd stick with the factory just, you know, just from the safety factor. Because uh, be, that, that's why they put the collapsible feature in steering shafts is so the under frontal impact, you know, it doesn't just push the whole thing right into your chest. That's kind of a gruesome thought. But, okay. Okay. <laughs> Here's a really good comment from Ben O'Connor. Um, this is a quote from Hal. We reserve the right to learn. Hal Bear. Yeah. Well, that's that's a good point. Yeah, we, we met Ben decades ago when he was working for Bear Brakes, and then he moved over to Impact, and we, you know, we stay in touch, and we use Bear Brakes, and we use Impact safety stuff, so. Okay, so if anybody has any other questions, this is the time to add them. This is last call for questions. Um, let me see if I've missed anything. If I've missed anything, quick type in and let me know. Let's see. Oh, here's an interesting one. This is just more adulation, so, but it, it's so true. So here we go. Kenny's right. The Academy makes my track days better. My tire pressures, the car's handling, camber issues all improved. Uh, that's a pretty big statement. So, Well, thank you for that. That's a, The whole idea is the Academy is to give you guys real information based off of my experience. Because like I say, the worst place to get information about your car is in the pack. Because this guy down there is going to say, oh, I'll do this. And the other guy says, oh, I'll do that. They have no idea what they're talking about. I mean, they're operating on I mean, this much information. And, you know, they don't know what's in your car, uh, how your car works. So the whole idea is to give you a, a real education on everything, that, how everything works and how you put it together. And then how to set up and adjust. We even talk about, in fact, behind me, that's uh, I was from... And that was from last week. Even talk about how to set your your paddock up, your pit up in the paddock when you go to a track day. So it's a pretty pretty comprehensive program. And like I say, the end it, it, the end is when we get to all the adjustments and setup and everything. But I do that at the end because I want to get through everything else first. You know, we 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 look at not only shock absorbers but the different kinds, how they work. Uh, we sort of dissect them, so to speak. And then again, a lot of suspension stuff, a lot of geometry stuff, a lot of aero stuff, safety, uh, plumbing, cooling, and it goes on and on and on. So. Okay, here we go. Oh, Kobe, you're killing me. <laughs> so, and you're so right. When will you have hats and shirts available? Um, I need to commit, commit to this. It's on my list. It's been on the list since we started Cars and Coffee. Um, so, Ken, you can harass me on this. Kobe, well, let me, I, I do. I know. Kobe, let me get back to you next weekend and I'll try to come up with a firm date because I that's I think about that every week. Um hats. Yeah, I can I can I can truthfully say she's been talking about it for about a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. First, we've got we've got I mean, there's not a lot of us and we've got a lot going on. Uh and uh, we you know between the you know the, the Saturdays and my classes and everything. And of course Carrie's kind of been out for a little bit, so that makes it even worse. Okay, here we have another question. Um, Roy Merrick. Uh, Merck, Roy, is, Rory. Rory, yeah, sorry about that, Rory. I really butchered your name. Is there different center sections available for the Fox IRS, and is cast better than aluminum? Uh, no, I mean, you basically got your choice of the, uh, you know, aluminum is the best, uh, is lighter, and it's, it's uh, uh, I, I would just automatically go with aluminum. I think the cast ones are, were in like maybe the T-Birds and the, the Mark, seven or eights, whatever they are. Uh, but, you know, the, uh, the aluminum, I, aluminum in a center section is the best with the torsion in it. And we always put torsions in the IRS cars because it works wonderfully. So, yeah, if you're going to do an IRS and a Fox, uh, you know, aluminum, uh, all the way aluminum. Also, I might point out that we have, are we supposed to do an IRS workshop coming up here too pretty soon? Yeah, too? We have so many workshops a little time. Yeah. Okay. So just going uh, forward, every third month, uh, third Wednesday of the month, we're going to be having a workshop going forward. So. Okay. Uh, 
when, when we do our IRS, because we're the only guys that really, really understand and know how to make IRS work in, in Mustangs, is because you know, back in the 70s, I was working on IRS cars, and you know, to me, it was no big deal. I knew how to make them work. Uh, we do, I had like four upgrades uh, to the IRS package. One of the first is the like the, uh, the forward torque brace, aluminum diff bushings, a rear steer kit, help take out some of the roll steer in the car. And then the second upgrade is the uh, tubular lower control arms with coilover shocks. The third is the tubular upper control arms, which weigh less than half the factory. And then the fourth one is we actually take and make a complete geometry change on the carrier. You know, we cut all the pickup points off and they're put back on uh, to optimize the geometry as best can be optimized within the architecture. But as part of that package, we actually cut off, there's a great big, huge clunky <clears throat> mount that goes in the back uh, that we actually cut that off and we put a bracket so that it bolts directly to the frame rail. Uh, so it takes a great big chunk of metal out. Uh, you can get wider tires on there, so, but it also, if, if the, uh, the carrier in the back is bolted solid to the, the uh, uh, frame rail, I mean, it's not moving anywhere. But we just recently have made an update to that bracket. We put uh, a couple extra holes so that it will bolt on to most Fox bodies. I'm not going to say all because there's like from 79 to, to 93, there's, there, I mean, you get the, the 486 and there's, you know, the, some of the Fox bodies are kind of strange, but it should bolt on to most of them to the existing uh, holes for the, uh, uh, the quad shock. So. Okay, here we go. Um, we have another question. And here we go. Having your rear grip kit installed without your front kit yet. Any recommendation setting for the front? Uh, yeah, I mean, the settings would be the same. Uh, it, it just, with the front grip kit, it, the car is just going to, when you turn the wheel, it's going to turn. But, I mean, it's the same. We've got the uh, alignment settings are, should be in the resource section of the Speed Therapy Society. <clears throat> but uh, basically, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, for, the, for the street, we're looking about negative, negative 0.1, negative 0.125 camber. Caster, maximum caster, as much caster as it'll take. Uh, and then toe, uh, 16th, or, uh, toe out, which is you know, minus 0.25 to minus 0.3. Uh, be the same. Now, when you get on track, uh, it'll take... You know, you got to be running at least two and a half degrees of camber. I, I don't like running more three degrees camber because you're not putting enough tire on the ground. Uh, but the big thing about the front grip kit is when you turn, when you turn the wheel, the car turns. Uh, I think uh, Wendy, uh, who's, who's one of our, our people that uh, have the suspension on, when she put the front grip kit on, her comment was that now when she went to the corner, Rather than turning the wheel and waiting, you know, waiting for the understeer to stop and for it to grip, that when you turn the wheel, it just turns. Uh, two things that, 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 that get, get fed back to me at people when they first drive uh, their S197 with uh, their full 4.0 suspension system on there. Uh, first thing that happens is they come up to a you know, hard braking zone, they hit the brakes, and then they have to drive up to the corner again and hit the brakes again because it stops so short. And the next thing is a lot of people, when they turn in, they actually turn over the inside curve because they're not used to the car turning so sharp. So, I mean, the, the alignment would be the same. You just have to watch, you know, if you're on track, uh, your geometry isn't going to be good enough to make it turn really well. Uh, that's where the front grip kit comes into play. And the suspension settings are, are on the somewhere in the society, the resource section. You can just download them uh, and stick them in your notebook. Okay, so we continually have uh, questions coming in. Okay, Kenny, we need, we're going to need to negotiate after this because now you're on your talent overtime wages because it's uh, one hour past uh, the time you've been on. So anyway, here's your next question. Uh, A2D Racing. I have an iris frame on the way, on the way from you. Um, I have yet to see a drag racer apply your modded IRS chassis, so fingers crossed on the geometry changes and extra anti-squat helps launching my IRS 03 Cobra. Yeah, I mean, it should. The thing about <clears throat> the drag racing and, and road racing is our anti-squat, I mean, the principles, you know, in geometry that I use to engineer a car to get grip and get off a corner, 
basically would transfer over to the drag strip. Uh, you know, it's going to make more grip. And then, of course, you've got to have a really good set of springs and shocks. Uh, that's one of the problems is uh, uh, not having enough spring or shock in the back, especially shock to con control the back rear axle. But, uh, yeah, with the with the urethane, with the upper and lower control arms and urethane bushings, the front solid mount on the diff uh, forward, you know, torque brace and aluminum diff bushings, uh, and the geometry, it, it should you should have a noticeable improvement on forward bike. Even though IRS cars are not really good for drag racing uh, because you know, they're, they're, it's a limit to how much anti-squat you can actually put into them realistically. But it, it will be better than, than factory. I'll put it that way. Okay. Okay. Here is our last question of the day, and I think it is a stumper. You ready? Yep. Ben O'Connor, how much camber should I run on my pit trailer? Well, it depends on if you're doing track days or road racing with your pit trailer. Because uh, you're going to want more and more if you're racing. And less if you're just kind of running around the pits, you really don't need much camber. So. <laughs> Okay, so that's it for today. Um, I just wanted to add one more thing and then we're done. We won't drag this out any longer. But if you're enjoying the um, Cars and Coffee and there's something you want to go back and reference, uh, just realize that on YouTube we have all the episodes listed on there so you can replay the whole episode. And Brad is actually breaking down snippets of each one of Kenny's segments. So you should be able to go, to, go there and if you're looking for something on breaks, There'll be a break section you can maybe find uh, what Kenny was referencing. So I'll be a little short of maybe three to five minutes. So enjoy that. Oh, we have one more comment here. Let's see. Um, nope, it's just a YouTube channel. Okay, we're done. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, and that's actually Kenny Brown Performance TV on YouTube. There's there's tons of content there. Uh, this is episode 65. You know, it's hard to believe. But all 65 episodes are there, along with a, a whole bunch of other like tech things. So it's it's a genuine resource. Uh, certainly go there and have a look around, uh, share it with your friends. You know, because the more the merrier. Uh, the more people we have getting on board, the more educated people we have out there, and the less disinformation that's out there. So listen, I'm, I enjoyed being here today. I hope you learned something. Uh, if you want to learn more, we've got the uh, <clears throat> the workshop coming up. And if you want to even learn more than that, we've got another academy coming up. So I uh, thank everybody for being here. Again, I hope you enjoyed it and you learned something because that's the whole idea. And again, if you've got questions or subject matter that you want me to talk about, send it in through the uh, Speed Therapy Society uh, or email it in. And, uh, you know, I'll put that on, on, on the docket. And, you know, because I talk about what you guys want to learn about. Just like today, uh, Omar and Maggie want to know about suspensions. You got just a little bit of taste of suspensions, but I hope you learned something. Okay, have a good Week and weekend, uh, the Academy guys, I'll see you Tuesday night. Everybody else, I'll see you this weekend. Good night or good day. <laughs> Goodbye.